can a hero be evil? A lot of writers have explored the idea of the heroic villain. Elric of Mel Melnibony is a good example. Some more recent examples would be the Punisher or Deadpool. Clearly evil, but fighting the good fight, opposing a greater evil, or avenging a wrong. In Dragonlance, Wizards of the Black Robes are evil by definition. If they weren't, they wouldn't have taken the Black Robes. While often villainous, they aren't always the villain. While some Black Robe Wizards have taken service with the Dragon Queen, most do not. Nuatari, the god of dark magic and patron of the Black Robes, is no friend to, to Kesis, and the Wizards, unlike clerics, aren't bound to the god's service in exchange for their powers, they generally do support the ideals and causes of their god. Our hero today is one such anti-hero, and this is his story. Hi everyone, and welcome to a sinister <laughs> episode of The, the Dungeon, Dungeon Crashers. Crashers. I'm Guy. And I'm Zapeel. Before we get started, please like this video, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of our exciting D&D &D content. We would like to wish everyone a happy holidays and a happy new year. Last time we said we would be building the Knight of the Rose, but that build didn't come together yet, so today we are building the Black Robes Wizard. In the world of Kern, wizards aren't common and most are under the authority of the Tower of High Sorcery, but some are renegades that practice magic secretly and avoid the attention of the mages of High Sorcery. Our hero begins as an apprentice of one of these renegades. As an orphan living on the streets, our hero made his way into the world through petty thievery and begging. He took shelter with a small gang of pickpockets that were ruled over by a vicious thug that exploited them, but they had nowhere to go, and if they escaped, the master made a point of killing any who tried. One day without warning or ceremony, the boss informed him that he had been sold to a new master and would be leaving today. Scared, but knowing he had no choice in the matter, he accepted his fate, hoping only that his new master was another thief and not a whoremonger. As it turned out, his new master was neither, and he also wasn't a pervert that lusted over young boys. Instead, he claimed to be a wizard. Our hero was taken to a beautiful home in the city, where he was put under the care of the servants and was bathed and given new clothes. His new master informed him he was to be a wizard's apprentice. Having no understanding of magic and knowing of wizards only through stories, he didn't know what to think, but decided it was much better than living on the street. Our hero is human, and we are using the variant human. Unlike most races, humans don't get any particular racial abilities. Instead, they gain one skill proficiency of their choice and a feat. For the skill, he takes sleight of hand because of his life on, as a pickpocket. For the feat, he chooses Resilient Feat, which gives him proficiency with one type of saving throw and plus one to that ability score of the saving throw, and he chooses Constitution. Humans get two plus one ability score bonuses that they can put on two abilities of their choice. Using Point by, we put an eight on Strength. He is a small boy and doesn't get much bigger as he ages. We put a 13 on Dexterity, making it 14 with a bonus point and we put 13 on Constitution, which becomes 14 with the boost from the Resilient Feat. We put a 15 on Intelligence, making it 16 with the second bonus point. Lastly, we put a 12 on both Wisdom and Charisma. He needs to be both persuasive and insightful. For background, we are using the Mage of High Sorcery background from Shadows of the Dragon Queen. Our hero's master was a renegade, but still taught his apprentice the basic skills that any wizard apprentice would gain. Our hero gets the skills History and Arcana. Normally the background also lets the character have unlimited lodging in the Tower of High Sorcery and receive hospitality from other wizards of High Sorcery, but our hero is apprenticed to a renegade and those benefits won't come into play until later. The background also gives the Initiate of High Sorcery feat. This gives him one cantrip from the wizard list and he is going to take Green Flame Blade. He also gains two first level spells he chooses these spells from a list determined by the moon that he draws power from, and he chooses Nuatari, and can pick from Hex, False Life, Dissonant Whispers, and Ray of Sickness. He takes False Life and Dissonant Whispers. The casting ability of these spells is his choice of Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma, and he chooses Intelligence. He can cast these spells once per day without using a spell slot and cast them with any spell slot he has. At first, our hero receives only minimal magical training. His master preferred to use his other skills. Our hero's new master was to be blunt, a charlatan. Mm -hmm. 
He used both cunning and magic to swindle merchants, blackmail nobles and priests, and sell secrets uncovered with divination and spying. Our hero played many roles, sometimes spying on a noble to learn his secrets, other times posing as a young noble himself as part of a con game, or seducing chambermaids to gain access to the homes of wealthy merchants. During this time, he also studied the basics of magic, mastering a few spells. He also honed his skills in deception and thievery. He trained with sword masters, learning to fence with a rapier in order to pose as a gentleman, and learning to fight with a short sword to defend himself when sneaking through the more unsavory parts of the city. He begins playing not as a wizard, but as a rogue. He gains four skills from the rogue list, and he takes persuasion, deception, insight, and stealth. He's proficient with simple weapons, short swords, rapiers, long swords, and hand crossbows. He is also proficient with thieves' tools, as well as intelligence and dexterity saves. Rogues can gain expertise in two skills, and he takes deception and insight. The first to run a good con, and the second to avoid being conned. He can also speak thieves' cant, which is a coded language that can only be understood by other rogues. Rogues also get sneak attack. Once per turn, when he hits with a finesse or ranged weapon, he can add 1d6 to the damage, provided he has advantage on the roll, or there is another enemy of the target within 5 feet. At second level, his master has finally taught him the basics of wizardry. He becomes a first level wizard and has prepared a spell book containing six first level spells. He has scribed Detect Magic, Identify, Find Familiar, Shield, Ray of Sickness, and Sleep. If your DM allows spells from Unearthed Arcana, there is a spell that would suit him well. It's called like Id Insinuation and is found in Unearthed Arcana 66. It can incapacitate an enemy that fails a wisdom save and deal ongoing psychic damage. If your DM permits it, he should take that instead of sleep. He also learns three cantrips from the wizard list and chooses Chill Touch for a range attack, Mind Sliver for a saving throw attack that targets intelligence and deals psychic damage, and weakens its resistance to magical attacks, and Friends to quickly bind people to his will. Using Find Familiar, he conjures a black cat to be his helper and companion. He does not want to draw attention to his use of wizardry, and a cat is inconspicuous in the city. He has two first level spell slots and can prepare a number of spells equal to his wizard level plus his intelligence modifier, so four for now. He doesn't need to prepare identify or find familiar as they are rituals and as a wizard he can cast a spell with the ritual tag without expending a spell slot or having it prepared by extending the casting time for ten minutes and having his spell book in his possession. Detect magic is also a ritual, but he will prepare it in case he needs to cast it quickly. As a wizard, he can use an arcane focus in place of material components for his spells, and he crafts a slim wand from maple wood inlaid with silver. He also gains arcane recovery, which lets him recover a number of spell slots equal to half his wizard level rounded up on short rest. At third level, he becomes a second level wizard, and he chooses a school of magic, and he is an enchanter. He only spends half the time in gold to scribe enchantment spells into his spell book, and he gains hypnotic gaze. Using his action to enthrall a creature within five feet that can hear him, it makes a wisdom save or is charmed, and while charmed it's incapacitated and its speed drops to zero. On subsequent turns, he can use his action to keep the creature enthralled until the end of his next turn. The effect ends if the creature is more than five feet from him or it takes damage. If the creature makes the wisdom save, he can't use this effect on it again for 24 hours. He also gains a third first level spell slot and adds two more spells to his spell book and he chooses Silvery Barbs and Charm Person. At fourth level he becomes a third level wizard. He gains a fourth first level spell slot and two second level spell slots and can add two spells to his book that can be up to second level and he chooses Detect Thoughts and Suggestion to help him in his work. His master has been stingy in teaching him magic and he is growing impatient. As his power grows, he is less the scared orphan that did what he was told, and more of a cunning and resourceful wizard in his own right. Only the fear of his master's power kept him in check, and that was fading. One day, a figure appeared in their home. It didn't use a door, it just appeared. It was a dark-haired man, older than the master, but carried himself with youthful vigor. He was clad in white robes and holding a staff. He spoke directly to the master and said, We have left you alone, renegade, because your power was inconsequential but your misdeeds have become many and it's time you were brought to heal. You can come and submit yourself to the test of high sorcery or I can slay you here and now. The master didn't hesitate, conjuring a blade of shadow into his hand with one breath and a torrent of flame at the intruder with the next, or tried to. With a brief gesture, the intruder canceled his master's fire spell and unleashed his own spell of destruction, a bolt of shimmering light that reduced the master instantly to dust. 
The intruder turned to our hero and said, So what are you to him? Servant? Lover? Accomplice? Our hero mustered his confidence and replied, I am his apprentice, and I do wish to take the trial of high sorcery. The intruder seemed surprised and answered, Your master was a renegade, and his apprentice has no standing, but show me your power, and perhaps I will sponsor you. Our hero presented his most powerful magic, the charm of suggestion. Although it apparently had no effect on the white robes, it did seem to impress him. He said, Very well, you have the necessary power. I will take you to the Tower of High Sorcery, but for your sake I hope the renegade taught you more than just spellcraft. The test of high sorcery was far worse than he expected. His former master had never spoke of it, so he had no information. Only a few words from the white robes who had brought him, warning that failure would end in his death. He expected to be tested on his knowledge of magic, and in some ways he was, but he was also forced to face his greatest fears. In addition, he saw visions of cities in ruin, scorched by dragon fire, and looted by armies. He saw his old companions among the pickpockets murdered by goblins, and though he had thought he felt no attachment to it, filled him with rage, and at the end he heard one word that echoed in his mind, Tachesis. He left the test shaken and trembling, covered in sweat. Though he couldn't remember what he had battled, his magic was exhausted and he had deep wounds on his arms that left scars that no magic would ever heal. Upon leaving the chamber, he was presented with three robes to choose from, one white like the wizard who brought him, another a deep crimson, and the last robe of a black silk. Although he had not been told what the robes were for, he knew instinctively and without hesitation he garbed himself in the black robe. Before leaving the tower, the wizard who brought him stopped to speak. He seemed disappointed in his choice of the black robes, but only said, Now you are one of us. Where will you go and what will you do? Our hero thought deeply before answering and said, For now I will return to where I came from and take possession of the Renegade's home as much labor went into funding it, but I don't think I will continue my old master's work. I feel that I have been given a duty and I need time to reflect on it. The white robe seemed surprised and possibly pleased by the answer and offered to deliver him home using magic, an offer our hero gladly accepted. At 5th level, he becomes a 4th level wizard, gaining an ability score improvement or a feat, and he's going to choose the Adept of the Black Robes feat. This is another feat from Shadows of the Dragon Queen. It gives him Ambitious Magic, which is a 2nd level spell that he has always prepared and he can cast once per day without expending a spell slot. It must be from the Necromancy or Enchantment School, and the castability for it is the same as he chose for the Initiative of High Sorcery. He chooses Tasha's Mind Whip, which deals psychic damage and hampers enemies if they fail an intelligence save. He also gains Life Channel. When a creature within 60 feet fails a save against the spell he casts that deals damage, he may expend a number of hit dice up to the level of the spell, roll them, and add the total to the damage of the spell. He also learns another cantrip and gains a third second level spell slot and he can add two more spells to his book up to second level and he chooses Scorching Ray and Shadow Blade. Shadow Blade is a finesse weapon so he can use his sneak attack with it. By rules as written, he can't use it to cast Green Flame Blade, but ask your DM, we ignore this in our campaign and from what we can tell, the rule requiring the weapon used to have a value of one silver piece wasn't intended to affect the blade cantrips being used with Shadow Blade. For his new cantrip, he chooses Minor Illusion for its usefulness and versatility. The White Robes guested with him for a few days, telling him many things about the Order and its history and duties. He learns that the Orders are sometimes opposed, but not enemies, and will work together for the good of magic as a whole. He learns about the gods of magic and their influence on the mortal world. The White Robes leaves him with good wishes, but cautions him that actions have consequences, and the governments of the world often reject wizards who abuse their power, and in some cases other wizards will oppose him if they believe he is working for the bad ends. At 6th level, he becomes a 5th level wizard. He gains two 3rd level spell slots and can add two more spells to his book that can be up to 3rd level. He chooses Fast Friends to bind enemies to his service, and enemies abound to sow confusion among those who would harm him. At 7th level, he becomes a 6th level wizard. From the School of Enchantment, he gains Instinctive Charm. When a creature he can see within 30 feet of him makes an attack roll against him, he can use his reaction to divert the attack. 
He must do so before he knows whether the attack would hit, and the target must make a wisdom save against his spell DC or change the target to the nearest creature that isn't the enchanter or itself. If multiple creatures are equally close, it can choose which one to attack. This ability is an excellent defense and should be used frequently, but remember that since it uses your reaction, you can't use shield or silvery barbs if the creature makes it save. He can also add two more spells to a spell book, and for the first he takes Animate Dead. He doesn't want to rely on other people for defense, so he animates a skeleton, which he armors in chainmail and shrouds with a rope. The second spell he takes is Magic Circle. In a normal game, I wouldn't take this from leveling up because it has no important use for it right now and I would try to find it or buy it when it is needed, but since here at the Dungeon Crashers, we don't know how easy it is to acquire spells in other people's games, so we are taking it now because it is eventually going to get a lot of use out of it. While he had no intention to continue his former master's network of intrigue and corruption, he found that keeping the household was expensive, as was the practice of magic, so he took over where his former master left off, blackmailing corrupt priests and aldermen, swindling nobles and merchants, and otherwise gathering wealth. But he never forgot his vision in the tower. War was coming and he needed to be ready for it. At 8th level he becomes a 7th level wizard. He gains a 4th level spell slot and can add 2 spells to his book that can be 4th level. He chooses Charm Monster for a more powerful tool for controlling people and things other than people. He also chooses Ralatham's Psychic Lance for a powerful attack that deals psychic damage and hampers enemies. At ninth level, he becomes an 8th level wizard, getting another ability score improvement or feat, and he increases intelligence to 18 to increase the power of his spellcasting. He can also add two more spells to his spellbook, and he chooses Vitriolic Sphere, which is a powerful area of effect acid attack, and Greater Invisibility, both for its value in stealth and intrigue and its power in combat. He had begun hearing rumors that the Dragon Queen Tachesis was active in the world and is gathering armies, just as he saw in his vision, during the test of high sorcery. He was also approached personally by one he suspected was a priest of the Dragon Queen. Whatever he was, he knew our hero was a wizard of the Black Robes and offered him great wealth to enter the Dragon Queen's service, which our hero diplomatically refused. The man then informed him that there was a wizard of the Red Robes who had angered Tachesis and the Dragon Queen was offering a reward for her death or capture. Our hero declined again, saying it wouldn't suit him to oppose another member of the Order at this time. The stranger told him that the Red Robes was no true wizard, but a half-elven heretic that uses primal magic in defiance of rule and tradition, and the Order would be unlikely to mourn her loss. Our hero thanked the stranger for his visit, and sent him off with pleasantries and vague assurances that he had no intention of keeping. He then retired to his study and used items of power that belonged to his former master to seek out and contact this half-elven heretic and warn her of the Dragon Queen's intentions. At 10th level, he becomes a 9th level wizard. He gains a 3rd, 4th level spell slot and a 5th level spell slot and can add 2 spells to his spellbook that can be up to 5th level. Here is where we get to use that magic circle that we took at 6th level wizard. He adds the spells Planar Binding and Infernal Calling to his spellbook. Infernal Calling is a good spell in its own right, but risky. It summons the Devil of up to challenge rating 6. The Devil is under control of the DM and unfriendly to the wizard and his party. It will assist the caster if it suits the Devil, but could also choose to attack the caster and its allies. The caster can attempt to command the Devil by issuing a command, no action required. He makes a Persuasion, Intimidation, or Deception check against the Devil's insight, and if he succeeds, the Devil obeys the command until the end of its next turn. The caster gets advantage on the check if he says the devil's true name. Check with your DM about how to find that out. Our hero has a positive charisma modifier and expertise in deception, so he should have success with this. Barb devils are a good choice. They are challenge rating 5 and pretty tough. Their wisdom modifier is plus 2, but they don't have insight proficiency, so it should be easy to control. The devil we really want is the white Abishai. It is a servant of Tachesis, and it would be cool to use it against her. It is challenge rating 6 and very strong, and its wisdom modifier is only plus 1. When he has higher level spell slots, he gets some more powerful devils. Planar Binding makes Infernal Calling even better. The caster summons the devil into an inverted magic circle and then casts Planar Binding. If the devil fails a charisma save, it is bound to serve the caster faithfully for 24 hours. The drawback is that the spell requires a 1000 gold piece gem which the spell consumes, but our hero should be quite wealthy at this point. When he has higher level spell slots, he can command the devil for longer periods of time. 
The red-robed sorceress arrived at his home using his former master's teleportation circle. She was suspicious of him at first, but he calmed her fears and assured her he meant her no harm. Our hero found the red robes charming in the extreme. In the past, he thought of women as marks to be swindled or tools to swindle others. But he found this half-elf to be far more than that. He wanted to please her and protect her. He told her of the Dragon Queen's armies, and, he, and she told him that she knew of them as well. She stayed with him for several days. During this time, he was contacted magically by the white robes wizard that had sponsored him for the trial. The wizard told him that one of his own apprentices, the white robes that dwelt in the east, was defending a town from the Dragon Queen's armies and needed assistance. The old wizard was involved in his own struggles and could not assist and asked our hero to come to the apprentice's aid. And when our hero agreed, the old wizard instructed him on the runes he would need to access his apprentice's teleportation circle. Our hero knew nothing of teleportation magic, but fortunately the red robes did and they traveled to aid in the defense of the town. At 11th level, he becomes a 10th level wizard. From the school of enchantment, he gains split enchantment. When casting an enchantment spell that targets one creature, he can target two instead. Not only will this make spells like Charm, Monster, and Suggested more effective, he also has psychic attack spells such as It Insinuation, Tasha's Mind Whip, and Ralathan Psychic Lanch, which will be devastating when used on two targets. He also gains a second 5th level spell slot and can add two spells to his book of up to 5th level. He chooses Hold Monster, which will also work with Split Enchantment, and Synaptic Static, which is an area of effect psychic attack that also hampers enemies. He also learns another cantrip, and he takes Acid Splash for a ranged attack that can hit multiple targets. At 12th level, he becomes an 11th level wizard. He gets a 6th level spell slot and can add 2 spells to his book that can be up to 6th level, and he chooses Disintegrate and Create Undead. Create Undead, which will let him animate up to 3 ghouls, which remain under his control for 24 hours. After that, he can cast the spell again to control them for another 24 hours. When he has higher level spell slots, he can get either more ghouls or more powerful undead. At 13th level, he becomes a 12th level wizard, getting an ability score improvement or a feat, and he is going to increase his dexterity to 16. He is a little low on defensive spells and hit points, so extra armor class will be welcome, and it will help with his attacks with his rapier or shadow blade. He can also add two more spells of up to 6th level to his book, and he chooses Mass Suggestion and Summon Fiend. At 14th level, he becomes a 13th level wizard. He gets a 7th level spell slot and can add two more spells to his book of up to 7th level. He chooses Finger of Death and Simulacrum. Simulacrum allows him to sculpt a duplicate of any creature out of snow and powdered ruby that becomes an exact duplicate of the creature with all its abilities, but only half the hit points and no equipment. A caster can only have one duplicate at a time. If it is killed or dispelled, it melts, but if it is damaged, the caster can prepare it at an alchemy lab at a cost of 100 gold piece per hit point. In some cases, it would be cheaper to just make a new one. He can copy any beast or humanoid that he can keep around for a whole 12-hour casting time, which could be himself. Having a spare 13th level wizard around can be pretty handy. Or if he encounters a particularly powerful beast or humanoid and can imprison it somehow for 12 hours, that would work as well. And don't forget, he is an enchanter, so he could manage to convince a high-level paladin to set as a model for 12 hours. The possibilities are endless. They arrive at the home of the white-robed wizard. He is younger than both himself and the, the red robes, but seems quite confident, but seems just as taken with the red robes as our hero is. The Red Robes also seems more powerful than either of them and has experience fighting the forces of Tachesis, so they agree to let her take the lead. It proved to be a good choice. With her leadership and the combined power of the three mages of high sorcery, they were able to defeat the attacking forces. The battle was fierce. The enemies included ogres and other monstrosities, and a treacherous wizard of the Black Robes supported them, but the outcome was never in doubt. His conjured devil and undead servitors wrought terrible destruction on the enemy, and the white robes dueled the enemy wizard, personally crushing him with blasts of fire and force while casually countering or deflecting the enemy's attacks. At 15th level, he becomes a 14th level wizard. From the school of enchantment, he gains the ability to alter memories. 
He can cause those affected by his enchantments to be unaware that they were charmed, and he can also cause them to forget some of the time they were under the influence of his charm spells for up to one hour plus one hour for each point of his charisma modifier if they fail an intelligence save against the wizard's DC. So he could charm a wealthy noble and persuade him to grant him a gift of thousands of gold pieces and then make him believe he did it willingly or even forget doing it. He can also add two more spells to a spell book that can be up to 7th level, and he chooses Power Word Pain and Create Majin. Power Word Pain can cripple an enemy if it has less than 100 hit points. This is its current hit points, not the total, so if it is strong, blast it with Disintegrate first, then hit it with Power Word Pain. The spell is also an enchantment that targets one creature, so you can use it with Splint Enchantment to affect a second creature as well. Create Majin. This spell allows him to craft a doll that he can then transform into a creature called a Majin that lasts until it is destroyed. There is no limit to the number of Majin he can create, but each one reduces his hit point maximum by an amount equal to its challenge rating, and this loss is permanent and can only be undone by a wish. There are three types of Majin that all have different abilities and challenge ratings. The description of the spell and the stat blocks for the Majin can be found in the Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. This is a Forgotten Realms adventure, so your DM might not allow material from it in Dragonlance. In which case, you should choose a different 7th level spell. Something useful like Force Cage or Teleport would also be a good choice. Having seen the threat that the Dragon Queen posed, the three mages agreed to continue to work together and gathered to themselves a powerful force that included diverse elements, dwarven heroes, knights of Salomnia, and even a lone kinder who just happened to come along. <laughs> At 16th level, he becomes a 15th level wizard, gaining an 8th level spell slot and adding two spells to his book that can be up to 8th level. He chooses Horrid Wilting and Dominate Monster. Dominate Monster is another extraordinarily powerful enchantment that can target two creatures thanks to split enchantment. At 17th level, he becomes a 16th level wizard, getting an ability score improvement or feat, and he caps his intelligence 20 to maximize the save DCs of spells. He can also add two more spells to his spellbook, and he chooses Feeble Mind and Clone. Feeble Mind is a great way to cripple enemy spellcasters and hampers even non-casters, and is an enchantment so can target two creatures with split enchantment. Clone is a secret of immortality for a wizard. He creates a duplicate of himself with all of his powers and abilities that remains dormant until he dies at which times his soul enters the duplicate, animating it with all of his memories and personality. He can also make the clone at any age he wishes up to his own, so even if he dies of old age, he can return as a young, vigorous version of himself with all of the knowledge and powers he had as an old man. The clone doesn't have any equipment and is helpless until activated, so he needs a safe place to keep it and should at minimum provide it with clothing and a copy of his spellbook, along with whatever money and magic items he can spare to entomb with it. After a time, there is a lull in the fighting, and he returns to his home to make sure everything is in order, and to install a clone of himself in the cellar below his home that he protects with expensive locks and traps, as well as magical wards. When he returns to his companions, the Red Robes has brought her family to join them. Her mother, a powerful wizard of the White Robes, and her father, a legendary Kaganesi ranger, whose deeds are famous enough that even our heroes heard of them. They also brought with them a company of human and elven woodsmen who had been fighting the forces of Takesis. The White Robes has not been idle either, bringing with him his former master and a number of his fellow apprentices and a priest of Luminari. With their power augmented, they continue their campaign against the Dragon Queen. At 18th level, he becomes a 17th level wizard, gaining a single 9th level spell slot and can add two spells to his spellbook that can be up to 9th level. He chooses Psychic Scream and Wish. Psychic Scream is a devastating area of effect spell that deals psychic damage. Wish is chosen for its power and versatility, being able to destroy enemies, raise the dead, travel the planes, and many other things. It can also restore the hit points lost to its Create Magen spell. It will be up to your DM if this counts as a normal use of Wish or the more powerful and risky version. I think that since it specifically mentions in the Create Magen spell, it would count as a normal Wish, but your DM might disagree, especially since this would allow him to create as many Magen as he can <laughs> find the gold for. While a huge army of magen seems appropriate for such a powerful dark wizard, your DM might think it's a little much for his campaign, even at such a high level. At 19th level, he becomes an 18th level wizard and gets spell mastery, allowing him to choose a first and second level spell that he can cast whenever he wants without using a spell slot. The first level spell should be either shield or silvery barbs. Both are incredible with unlimited uses. 
A silvery barb is an enchantment. It might suit him better, but either is excellent. For the second level, he takes suggestion. This is another very powerful thing to be able to do at will, and it can be affected by split enchantment. He also adds two more spells to his book, thinking of the up to ninth level, and he chooses Gate and Imprisonment. Gate can allow him to call forth incredibly powerful allies, although they aren't required to serve him. This spell's power really depends on the role play and what your DM wants to allow. A player could make deals and contracts with powerful entities and requiring them to answer his call in exchange for whatever they ask from him. The beings will also be inclined to help if what he is asking of them suits their goals and temperament. Imprisonment is a difficult spell to use effectively in combat due to its long casting time, but as a roleplay device it's excellent. Not only can it get dispose of enemies without killing them, which can be useful, the chaining or slumber options could let him get an extremely powerful subject to create a simulacrum of. But remember that a simulacrum has to be a beast or humanoid, and most of those aren't powerful enough to require the spell. But if you can get something equivalent to an archmage or drow matron mother, it would be well worth it. <laughs> he also gains a third, fifth level spell slot. At 20th level, he becomes a 19th level wizard, getting a last ability score improvement or feat, and he needs either constitution or the tough feat. I recommend constitution to prove his concentration checks, but the tough feat would give him a much bigger increase in hit points. He also can add two more spells to his spellbook of any level, and you should fill any gaps in his arsenal that you haven't managed to cover through finding or buying spells to copy. We really wanted to give the feel of an evil wizard despite the fact that he's doing heroic things, so we focused on destructive spells, creating undead, summoning fiends, and dominating people through magic. Not only does it give him an evil feel, it's a very powerful tactic. One weakness is that we neglected a lot of important defensive and utility spells like Teleport, Blink, Globe of Invulnerability, and Foresight. We also neglected Divinations, which are important for most wizards. Fortunately, as a wizard, there are many ways to acquire these spells depending on your DM. With even a moderately generous Dungeon Master, a high-level wizard should have a vast library of spells. However, if this isn't the case, just build an army of Magian, Undead Minions, Diabolical Servants, and Brainwashed Soldiers, and have fun! We hope you enjoyed this character, and if so, please tell us about it in the comments, and join us next week when we get back to the Night of the Rose. Until then, cheers! cheers.